For RCR TV, I'm Sean Kinney, and welcome to HetNet Happenings. We're, we're going to dig into everything DOS, Wi Fi, small cell, and much more. Today's episode is brought to you by Comscope, thinking beyond today's technology to help you make the best decision for your network and your business. Today's episode is brought to you by TelecomCareers.com. All right, I'd like to welcome our guest, Jeff Andrews. Jeff's a professor for the University of Texas, Austin in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Jeff's also the Cullen Trust for Higher Education Endowed Professor in Engineering. And as this is our first episode of HetNet Happenings, I'd like to sort of lay a strong foundation and draw on Jeff's expertise to take our viewers through the evolution of uh, cellular technology. So let's start at the beginning, if okay. we can, Jeff. Uh, I remember these days, late 80s, early 90s, when people still had the bag phones and all that sort of thing. I think Joey has a video that he can roll that'll remind our viewers of those. Go where you wanna go, call when you wanna call. Get the lowest price ever at Radio Shack on the most powerful transportable cellular phone system. Just $7.99 when you sign up with Radio Shack's authorized cellular phone carrier. Go where you wanna go. There's nothing else to buy, and it's ready to go wherever you go. Call when you want Use in your car or go portable and take it along. Radio Shack's complete transportable cellular phone system, just $7.99 only at Radio Shack. All right, Jeff, so back in those early days of cellular technology, it was I mean, nothing like what we have today with smartphones, but can you sort of take us from the AMP standard, the 1G, up through CSM and G, or CDMA and GSM, which would be the 2G? Sure. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, I was quite young at, at, at this time, you know, and I remember my my uncle was one of the only people I knew who had one of these first, you know, uh, amps phones, that, you know, actually was battery powered. Now, you know, this this battery lasts about 30 minutes yeah. um, of talk time and took about 15 or so hours to charge <laughs> and uh, and weighed uh, several pounds, you know, yeah. you could carry it, but you know, it was this really was a cell brick. And, you know, of course, up, you know, before that, these were connected to the cars, you know, they were actually called car phones in many cases. And so, you know, this was used for talking on the phone, these talk to towers that were in many cases could be 10 miles away. You know, a single cell would have on the order of 100 square miles or more mm -hmm. coverage area. So these were really a luxury item. Um, I did, you know, my uncle was the only person I knew who had one. And uh, so, you know, this was, you know, not, a, it was a very... Uh, elite technology. Of course, right. then you know people wanted this uh, this mobile uh, telephony. Um, so better standards were developed that were much more power efficient, uh, more reliable. Mm -hmm. um, the cell size is shrunk, which allowed more the, the spectrum to be reused, and so more subscribers could be fit in, which of course allowed the price to go down. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, the first two G standard that really uh, and and I think Joey has a slide that we can okay. put up for this part. But yeah, the two G standard. What was really markedly different from the one G? Well, the, the big I mean, the big difference is that one G was essentially just a two way FM radio, mm -hmm. um, and you know, so this is the kind of classic example where you could just tune in and listen on other people's conversations or sometimes mm -hmm. you'd hear other people's inadvertently. And so 2G, um, everything 2G was digital. Um, okay. So it was much harder to have crosstalk or to intercept these signals. Um, they were also much more efficient. efficient. They could make use of digital innovations such as air correction coding and um, you know new digital vocoders. Mm -hmm. um, so you could get the efficiency up as well as the security and robustness. Um, you know, the dominant one was actually developed in Europe. This is, you know, kind of to our shame as Americans, Europe's often been out ahead of us in these things, it, largely because they have perhaps a, you know, it's a large population, a more unified political system in some, in some certain ways can get things done. Um, and uh, so GSM was developed in Europe uh, in about 1991, if I mm -hmm. recall, and um, our, you know, 2G standards didn't get going until a little bit after that. Okay, and, and what was the, the difference between the European and the American standard? Well, the American one tried to essentially just build right upon AMPs and mm -hmm. just to, just took the AMPs channels and then reused those to create a TDMA digital system, um, whereas Europe just kind of had a clean slate design that uh, had a larger bandwidth and I think most people would agree was probably a better standard. I mean, still used today. I mean, uh, GSM still is a global standard. You can get, you mm -hmm. know, voice uh, voice calls are still often made over GSM in many parts of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been kind of phased out recently in the U.S., but until even a few years ago, often your voice calls were handled over this standard. Okay, and, and what uh, time period were these viable and in place? 
Well, so it's been. It, I know it's yeah, still it's, still in so place in some the parts. Ni- of the nineties. I mean, so yeah. the, you know, this the nineties were sort of the heyday of two G. But even you know, into uh, up until two thousand five, six, seven. I mean, you were using two G technology mm-hmm. pretty much almost exclusively. Three G rollouts began about the middle part of last decade. Okay, and then so after that, in the the early two thousands, you had sort of this explosion of the internet, where it, yes. it was you know just the development of lots of uh, different types of content, more people accessing the web, that sort of thing, led to the bubble and all that, but. The 2000s, the mid part of the 2000s, at least, we start to see the the real slow rollout of 3G. Yes. Okay. And so, what is the big advancement between 2 and 3G? Well, yeah. So 3G, um, interestingly, was is very similar to one of the 2G standards, which was uh, developed by Qualcomm mm-hmm. in the mid 90s, uh, based on CDMA. Mm-hmm. Um, very good standard for voice. Um, wound up being adopted by everyone for 3G. Okay. Um, and it actually, although it was designed to also carry data at higher data rates, 3G was still primarily a voice standard. I mean, that was where the money was coming from. That's mm-hmm. what consumers were paying their monthly bills yeah, to have. This is when we were concerned about minutes. Yeah, minutes, <laughs> yeah, minutes you know, and obviously, you know, texting is a very simple thing to do. It mm-hmm. you know, uses very little bandwidth. And so, yeah, texting and minutes is where the, you know, was what was paying the bills. That's right. And, um, and, and CDMA is good at carrying voice. And so it's, it's fundamentally a voice standard. Okay. And, and in terms of devices, this was sort of the heyday of the, uh, the Motorola Razor flip phone. If, sure. if we remember that, I think Joey has a video that he can put up for us. There's an incredible yeah. freedom that sure. comes with using a cellular yeah. phone. I got all my guys working on it right now. And once you've experienced it, there's no turning back. Now, through this special TV offer, you can receive a Motorola flip phone with Cellular One service for just pennies a day. Now, everyone can enjoy the freedom of a personal cellular phone. You can make a call anywhere or get a call anytime. Hi. Stuck in traffic? Call and change that meeting before you're late. Yeah, Dan, let's change the meeting to 10. Change of plans? Call me if you need No me. problem okay. with the flip phone. Can't remember those directions? Just give a call. Okay, right on Oak Street. It's that easy. Got car trouble? I can't get my car to start. Can you come and help? Help is just a call away. Order today and take advantage of Cellular One's great service for just pennies a day. All right, Jeff, and, and during the, the 3G era, there was a lot of sort of network capacity issues, right? There was even like in, in metro areas sort of network failure, so. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so I guess, I guess the razor, you know, which we just saw this video on, um, you know, this was sort of maybe the kind of the peak of the phone actually being a phone. Right. You know, this was still fundamentally a phone. It had a, a pretty color screen. Mm-hmm. It had this nice form factor, and but it still had a you know keys right to text you or to send anything uh, um, with uh, letters. You had to push in the numbers, you know, mm-hmm. in, the, in a certain pattern. To um, so yeah, so then you know, of course, after that we moved. You know, Blackberries became more popular. Blackberry was the you know really popular device. Uh, uh, Palms, and then of course the iPhone. And so you know, combination of all these devices, the internet really going mobile. People realizing that there's all these things they'd really like to do actually from mm. the mobile phone, like navigate. Yeah. Or um, uh, you know, web browse of various types. You know, this really started to strain the network and you know I think then the iPhone was just kind of the straw that broke the camel's back the big straw yeah and you know I, I remember that that historic announcement of of the first iPhone I think Joey has a video queued up for us an iPod a phone and an internet communicator an iPod a phone are you getting it These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, today Apple is going to reinvent the phone. So we just saw the iPhone there, and, and as you remember that announcement, it, it really combined the computer, the, the talk, I- into one device. And yeah. so this really mainstreamed the smartphone, which, you know, we talked about this before the show. It, in some ways, and there is disagreement, this sort of uh, prompted the need to make that 3G standard into something better. In, in, indeed. Uh, I mean, the first iPhone, it's kind of hard to believe at this time, you know, was actually on, on a 2G, mm-hmm. you know, used Edge 
um, which now, you know, you still occasionally get it on your phone and it's like almost a medieval technology, it seems like. <laughs> but um, yeah, so this, this really, uh, you know, 3G, this really accelerated the rollout of 3G. And in fact, you know, um, at this point, uh, there was already discussions of 4G going on because mm -hmm. uh, there was a belief that 3G wouldn't be all that great for data. Mm -hmm. And uh, so WiMAX was being developed around this time, actually had been developed, you know, the, the WiMAX standard that, that was developed at the end of 2005, but uh, the cellular guys weren't very interested in that. They wanted to make, you know, re, uh, re, uh, recoup their investment on 3G. And so they were rolling out 3G. Uh, but pretty soon 3G wasn't getting the job done, as we mm -hmm. know. I mean, in the late, latter part of last decade, I mean, most major cities, my phone at least, I couldn't get even simple things done mm -hmm. um, between you know 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. You know if I was in the Bay Area or New York or D.C. and, and even sometimes in Austin here, mm -hmm. um, so uh, it was clear that this wasn't working and something right. needed to be done. Um, you know, although it's it's worth noting that you know this is not all about developing a better standard. It's mm -hmm. about developing a better network, mm -hmm. of which a good standard is one part of that, right? A, a key part, but a, a lot of it's about you know putting in more base stations, small cells, you know, mm -hmm. that, that's really what's been carrying the freight here. I think there's a, a popular misconception that LTE somehow saved the day. Mm -hmm. And LTE is no doubt helpful, but it, a lot of it has been, been the deployment of more base stations, getting them to work better together, mm -hmm. um, you know, more and more Wi-Fi offloading. Um, so there's been a, a whole, it's been a kitchen sink really approach to mm -hmm. get us to now where your phone typically works, even though the demands in the network are even much higher than they were five years ago. Right, and so yeah, for four G, you mentioned a lot of these uh, complementary infrastructure components, like the Wi Fi offloading and and just the addition of physical infrastructure to support the network capacity demands. So, a lot of these elements uh, of four G are in flux right now as we look to five G. You know, yes. it's always about the next best thing, and this <laughs> is I know where a lot of your research is focused on is. 5G and and right now we've heard you know trial deployments in 2018 and some limited commercials starting in 2020. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done between now and then. Yes. And and part of that is just the very foundational defining the standard. What is 5G and what does the technology look like? So what do you think? Well, yeah, it's an exciting time. I mean, it's always uh, more fun as a researcher and. Uh, you know, an inventor to try, you know, to be working on something that's not defined yet and mm -hmm. then on something that's pretty well defined and then you're just making incremental changes. So, I mean, I think you know, the reality is LTE is a, a pretty darn good standard mm -hmm. um, and it has some legs on it and I think a lot can be done with LTE. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with 5G um, and how much different it is. Will it be a radical change? Right. Um, will it be a series of enhancements? Will it be something to try to integrate various mm -hmm. uh, disparate bands? Like try to, I mean, already we see Wi-Fi becoming more like cellular. Mm -hmm. the, the, they're becoming smarter though, the access, access points. They're putting network intelligence into and these. Voice wifi over Wi-Fi too. Yeah. Voice over Wi-Fi. And at the same time, cellular is becoming more like Wi-Fi. The cells mm -hmm. are shrinking, becoming smaller. The base stations used to cost half a million bucks. Mm -hmm. And now you have base stations that cost a thousand bucks mm -hmm. or even femto cells, which cost a couple hundred bucks. That's so, right. um, it, you know, it's kind of an interesting convergence, you know, on top of that, there's, again, it's going to be a kitchen sink approach. We see, you know, develop, you know, possibly cellular moving into the five gigahertz and license bands, which mm -hmm. is very controversial, but something that's being looked at possibly more spectrum being freed up through, um, you know, a novel auction procedures by the FCC. Mm -hmm. And then of course, um, there's a lot of hype around millimeter wave, which mm -hmm. is a notion of using very high frequencies that have historically been considered unusable uh, for cellular itself. Yeah, that's I wanted to sort of, as we talk about 5G, I, I know three big components that your research has looked at is uh, new spectrum, and then network densification, and then spectral efficiency. So let's, let's start with new spectrum. And you yes. mentioned millimeter wave, that's a you know, quickly developing technology. Uh, what are the, the good points of millimeter wave? What does it promise to do? And, and what are some of the drawbacks? Well, I mean, right now we have about a gigahertz of spectrum that's in use for broadband. About mm -hmm. half of that, about 500 megahertz is for Wi-Fi and about mm -hmm. 500 megahertz for cellular. Mm -hmm. Obviously this varies from country to country, but this is a good rule of thumb. Mm -hmm. So if we want to say double or triple the amount of spectrum, this is a this is a tall order, mm -hmm. you know. We need, and the only place such spectrum is available is at high frequencies, above 10 gigahertz, mostly above 20 gigahertz. Mm -hmm. So this spectrum, technically speaking, millimeter wave spectrum is the spectrum that has wavelengths from one millimeter to 10 millimeters mm -hmm. per centimeter, and this is from 30 gigahertz to 300 
mm -hmm. uh, gigahertz. Um, but colloquially, people are kind of referring to anything above 20 gigahertz up to you know, whatever, 300 gigahertz as millimeter wave. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is here that the wavelengths are very small, the antennas are small, um, and so there's a perception that these waves don't propagate well, mm -hmm. which is only half true. They propagate fine, which is why it's used for satellite communication and point-to-point -point backhaul, but you need to have much, you need to have either, you need to have very high gain antennas. You need mm -hmm. to have a special kind of antenna that basically points which is not how our cell phones currently work. Our cell phones just radiate energy off everywhere and then a very small fraction of it gets to the base station. Mm -hmm. Also, millimeter waves are more like light. They don't go through a lot of common objects very well. It's very hard to see how they'll work from outdoors to indoors or mm -hmm. vice versa. Um, so these are, very, these are major challenges that millimeter wave po poses, but on the flip side, there's a great deal of spectrum up there. It's mm -hmm. five gigahertz, easy, maybe more. Um, that we can use. So this is the only way we're going to get significantly more spectrum is if we yeah. can figure out how to harness these. And so there's a lot of work going on. Yeah, that. and you said millimeter waves, you know, they command a, a tiny antenna, but with the tiny antenna, you can use lots of them, right? That, that, so that's the idea, yeah. So the antenna is smaller, but then if you, you, then you can put a uh, hundred of them, right. even, in a, even in an iPhone. Mm -hmm. But then you have to somehow coordinate these antennas you can't to, for them to work well. Uh, they have to co-phase, and, 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 and so then there's lots of po possible channel estimation that's mm. involved. So there's challenges there, but in principle, it, it can work. Right, and, and, it, and it would stand there as, as a, just a supplement to your, your cellular coverage, right? Yeah, so I think that's what people think. It's not like 5G, um, although Samsung's been really you know, hyping this, and you know, there's, there's a few, you know, some in academia that say 5G is millimeter wave. Mm -hmm. Rather, I think... 5G will likely include yeah, millimeter okay. wave, at least in the long term, and it'll be like a booster technology, kind mm -hmm. of a offloading. So if there's a millimeter wave small cell in range, you go over to that guy, you can maybe get gigabit per second type rates, and it mm -hmm. takes you off the then more prime bands. Mm -hmm. And so it can both decongest, right. help decongest the prime bands that work kind of like we know today, mm -hmm. uh, as well as providing really opportunistic high rates. So I think that's yeah. the, the vision. And you mentioned small cells, that's sort of a natural segue into the second component of this, which is network densification, just adding capacity. Yes. And small cells is one way to do it, a distributed antenna system is another way to do it in a big indoor space. Yes. And is for, so as it applies to 5G, again, these are just supplements, right? It, it is, yes. I mean, densification in principle can work with any technology. I mean, mm -hmm. and that's really what's been carrying the freight for us for the right. last 20 years in terms of capacity. When you look at the numbers, almost all the capacity gain comes from just essentially having more base stations. And mm -hmm. by having more base stations, you can reuse the spectrum. Now, instead of 100 people sharing that base station, you have 10 or 5. Mm -hmm. And so just the, the bandwidth goes much further. Right. And so this is kind of a brute force approach. But on the other hand, it requires lots of... Uh, innovation as well, both on the device side, making it smaller, lower power, cheaper, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the network coordination, these ha you can't just shrink down a, a base station, you know, these require lots of maintenance mm -hmm. and tuning, and so these need to be much more self-deployable, be able to sense their environment, mm -hmm. um, and this is where LTE's been very helpful, is LTE is much more conducive to small stuff technology because of the multiple access approach. Um, so uh, there's a lot of ingredients to making densification work. It's mm -hmm. not like you just throw tons of infrastructure out there and it, and it, and it just works. But, um, you know, be, but fiber networks, meanwhile, have been get, being built out more and more. Google Fiber being one, an obvious visible example, but just in general, there's been lots of fiber build outs, higher capacity backhaul. These are also necessary ingredients for mm -hmm. densification. So this is uh, a very key part. Um, of, of the, the 5G story for sure. Okay, and then that next key part is uh, spectral efficiency. If you yes. could give us an idea of, of what uh, that might look like as it relates to 5G. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm the most bearish uh, on spectral efficiency gains. I think you know every standard has promised these large spectral efficiency gains and then they just really haven't materialized mm -hmm. when you look at the numbers. Um, you know, LTE spectral efficiency is actually only about 50% bigger mm -hmm. than 3G, which is not very much. I mean, right. when you consider that traffic demands have been doubling almost every year, mm -hmm. so this would get by us about six months, right. or something, you know, so that uh, from uh, for a standard that took 10 years to develop. So the so I think this there is you know, but on the spectral efficiency side, there are th some things we can do. Uh, one is adding more antennas and using mm -hmm. what's called MIMO or massive MIMO, mm -hmm. uh, the version that. 3GPP, the main standard body's looking at. If I, I don't mean to interrupt, yeah. but uh, multi-input, multi-output, if you could just give us a quick... Uh... Sorry, so yeah, basically the idea here is you add multiple antennas at both the transmitter and receiver, mm -hmm. and then through using signal processing, essentially send several parallel streams. Mm -hmm. 
using those antennas and then kind of are able to sort them out uh, at the transmitter and re at, at the receiver mm -hmm. to figure out. So you're causing spatial interference at the transmitter, but then are able to de decompose that. But this has turned out to be very hard in practice for a number of reasons. And mm -hmm. LTE includes MIMO. Mm -hmm. um, it, it works. It does increase the capacity. Um, and, but I think the hope is that 5G will go much further. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the things that are being looked at are three-dimensional uh, three channel modeling, installing arrays rather than in linear, but all you know, in, in, in three-dimensional patterns, so you get more complex scattering patterns mm -hmm. that you can exploit. So I think there's some promise to do better. You know, I think some of the numbers show perhaps two to three times better, maybe four times. In, mm -hmm. But uh, you know, this still I think is is a small gain compared to uh, what what we could get from going to millimeter wave adding more spectrum or particularly from densifying further. Mm -hmm. And so as 5G starts to take shape, and I've asked you this question before and I'm probably gonna ask it to you again, <laughs> do, do you think the R&D is tracking for what we've heard of a deployment schedule? I mean, is the, is the work on pace to meet that 2020 demand? I think so. I, 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 think so. Yeah. Um, I, I do, I, I mean, I think there's a, there's a pretty well, you know, awareness now of, you know, how rapidly the traffic's growing. I think, mm -hmm. you know, the operators are the ones who ultimately take the money and spend it. And so they need to be convinced that their customers want it. But I think they are, they know that they have to track this mm -hmm. or, you know, customers switch to a different provider who does. Um, so um, I think vendors, yeah, are, are definitely getting ready. Uh, I think the 5G standardization, as you mentioned, will probably start in 2017 mm -hmm. with, you know, test products probably in 2018, 2019. Um, and, you know, again, it just depends what 5G winds up being. Right. Um, and if it's, I think, millimeter wave, that component, I, you know, people are, get, get very highly varying answers. But I think early 2020s is really a best case for commercial commercialization. Yeah. Who's sort of on the leading edge of this research? For millimeter wave? Yeah. Well, you know, in academia, I think, um, you know, Ted Rappaport's been doing a lot of the channel modeling. It's gotten a lot of visibility. Robert Heath, my colleague at UT Austin, mm -hmm. uh, has really done a, a lot of a very uh, nice systems work and modeling work um, as well. Um, you know, there, there, there are others uh, as well. I mean, those are two of my, uh, the two of the ones that I'm, I'm the most aware of. Sundeep Rangan, also at uh, NYU, I've done a little work. But those are, I think, th some of the thought leaders. Uh, but a lot of this has been driven by industry as well. I yeah. mean, uh, I think Samsung really deserves a great deal of credit. It actually, it's, Sam, it's, it's the Samsung group just up the road here in Dallas that really mm -hmm. has driven this. Uh, Jerry P and Fruit Khan and, and, and their team um, uh, really, uh, you know, I think pushed this when no one else really thought it was possible mm -hmm. and tried to develop prototypes and took a great deal of risk uh, internally at Samsung to try to push something here that could give a 10x type gain. Yeah. Um, and they, you know, they engaged us, they engaged Ted when he was still at UT and, uh, you know, also uh, Amitava group, Gosha's group at uh, Nokia uh, mm -hmm. has, uh, up in Chicago has been a real, really out in front on this as well. Mm -hmm. I think those are some of the, the thought leaders. And if you could just give us an idea as we wrap up, uh, from a consumer perspective, if the millimeter wave and the spectral efficiency and the network densification is all realized as part of 5G, what's it going to do for me? Well, that's a great question. I mean, so... Uh, um, it's going to enable applications that you can't even imagine right now. I mm -hmm. mean, just uh, virtual reality type things. I mean, just streaming video will be a given. I mean, it'll actually work. You right. I mean, two-way video will work just seamlessly, beautifully. You're saying buffering will be a thing of the <laughs> past. <laughs> well, yeah, there might still be some buffering um, because, you know, it's wireless channel, you know, and there's always going to be uncertainties. I mean, you can just, just uh, wireless is hard. I mean, it yeah. always is going to be two orders of magnitude behind a wire's connection in terms of speed. It always mm -hmm. has been and it probably always will be. Um, so it's, it's wireless is, is, is a challenging environment. But I think, you know, we'll be able to really reliably do two-way real-time video. Mm -hmm. uh, there'll be, I think, you know, engineers like myself aren't typically the best at dreaming up apps. But I think at this <laughs> point, we have a great deal of faith that if we provide, uh, you know, really reliable tens, hundreds of megabits per second connections that app developers, that the platforms exist, the, develop, the app developers is a huge network of very smart people, mm -hmm. creative people thinking of applications. We, we're certain the bandwidth will be used. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's, a, it's really an exciting time watching this you know, technology go through this big transition. And uh, we really appreciate you coming in and joining us on HetNet Happenings to share your research and, and share your insights. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate it. Happy to be here.